Okay, the, the next speaker is Mark Schusterman, who will speak about what is it, uh, s uh, ranks of subgroups of bounded regenerated groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll do that in English, but I will still go from right to left, if it's okay with you. So I will start with a little definition. So given some positive integer n, we say that a group G is M boundedly generated and maybe we will just abbreviate it for short as M boundedly generated if there exist elements G1 till GM from the group G such that we can write the group G as a product, as a set of the cyclic subgroups generated by these M elements. Well, by that I do not mean that the group G is a direct product of these cyclic subgroups and I do not mean that they commute in some sense or are normal in any way. I just mean that as a set G is a product of these cyclic subgroups. So what this means is that for every element G in the group there exist some integers n1 Tn till nm such that G is equal to G1 to the n1 till Gm to the nm. So uh, this notion of uh, bounded generation is some refinement, if you want, of the notion of being finitely generated. So clearly a boundedly generated group is uh, finitely generated. So I will just make a definition to get rid of this M. So we will say that G <coughs> is boundedly generated if there exists some M such that G is M boundedly generated. So that is to say, I do not always care about what exactly is uh, this M. So now, uh, let me give you some examples of such groups with this property. So here we'll have examples. So maybe the first example, or even a pre-example, is that of a finite group. Clearly, every finite group satisfies this, but we're interested in infinite groups. So we will talk about them. So really the first example for me will be uh, finitely generated abelian groups. So if it is finitely generated, I will take the boundedly generating set just to be this finite generating set. And since, since the elements commute, I can always write them, every element in the group generated in any order I want. So the group is clearly boundedly generated. So the first, so the next, the second example, but it is a bit non-trivial, is of SL3Z. So this is just the group of three by three matrices with integer coefficients and determinant equal to one. So to see that this group is boundedly generated is not so easy. It's f the fact that it is finitely generated is not so difficult and is basically equivalent to Gaussian elimination. But to see that it's boundedly generated, it requires some number theory. So one proof that I know uses uh, Dirichlet's theorem that tells that every uh, every arithmetic progression contains infinitely many primes. So this is a bit non-trivial that it, this group is boundedly generated. And also as a generalization of this fact, we have that SLN of OK for every N greater than or equal 3 is boundedly generated when K is a number field, some finite extension of the rational numbers, and OK is its ring of integers. So even these ones these groups are boundedly generated. And, well, this also uses some more number theory, more class field theory to prove this fact. And there are many more examples of linear groups which are either known to be boundedly generated or conjectured to be boundedly generated. But it's important to know that not all boundedly generated groups are so nice, like linear groups or abelian groups. So there is a very interesting example of Muranov 
from 2005, which constructed an infinite, an infinite, finitely generated, simple, boundedly generated group. So there exists a simple group, which is the most complicated thing, which is boundedly generated. So I don't know, I find it uh, a bit uh, surprising or non-trivial. So the next one would be non-examples. So this will be non-examples. So naively, we could think that maybe every finitely generated group is boundedly generated. I mean, why not? But if there is one counterexample, then we know where to look for. It is the free group. If the free group were boundedly generated, then any image of it and any finitely generated group would have to be boundedly generated. So the first non-example would be that of a free non-abelian group on at least two generators. And we will shortly uh, prove this fact, although there are many, many trivial uh, elementary proofs of this statement. So my second example will be SL2Z, just to uh, contrast the situation we have here for three. So some linear groups are uh, not boundedly generated. And the reason for that is the following. Well, you can show that if you have a boundedly generated group, then you go to a finite index subgroup, it's still going to be boundedly generated. And vice versa also, if you go to a finite index overgroup, it's still going to be boundedly generated. Well, this is not a difficult exercise. And indeed, SL2Z has a finite index subgroup, which is isomorphic to a non-abelian free group. So for that reason, this group is also not boundedly generated. Well, and maybe another exotic example like we had here is that of finitely generated torsion <coughs> infinite groups. So in that case, such groups actually exist, and this is non-trivial construction. Well, by now, there are many, some of them by Alexander Olshansky. So if you take any such group, clearly every cyclic subgroup has finite order. So the product as a set will be a finite set. So we cannot cover the whole group G. So we also have these examples. So as you see, most of the interest in the bounded generation came for linear groups, as you see here and here. And this is because this property of being boundedly generated is related to the congruent subgroup property and, for, and to Kajdan's property T, but I will not elaborate on that so much. I will, yeah. If you replace where? G. Where? Ah, in both sides. Oh, in both sides. <laughs> so, well, this is a, not such a simple question, but I think that the answer will be the same. I mean, this will be still, and this won't be. And also, property T was studied for these groups, and this is actually an active area of research for polynomial groups over the integers. Yeah. If you put uh, CX in polynomials, if you, yeah. It's an open problem? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for informing us. Yeah, sure. FQT. FQT cannot be. Yeah, FQT, no. But it, will, it is boundedly generated by some other groups, and I will get to that. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I will get to that also. So now um, I will state the result uh, I want to tell you about today is the following. So if I'm taking G, an uh, M boundedly generated group for some M, and L, a finite index subgroup of G, then there exists a finite index subgroup U of L such that the number of generators of U is at most M where this is this M given in the assumptions of the theorem. So what I say is the following. You take an M boundedly generated group, you go to a finite index subgroup, then no matter what is the finite index subgroup, you can find maybe a smaller, but still a finite index subgroup U of L, which is generated by some fixed bounded number of elements. So here I'm talking about generation in the ordinary sense, not bounded generation, but generated as a group by at most M elements. 
Well, you could find this fact surprising because suppose for a free group, the number of generators grows with the index. In fact, it grows li linearly. So here we see that for boundedly generated groups, it may not grow at all. So this already provides us with a proof that this group is not boundedly generated. So for Gromov hyperbolic groups, they are also all not boundedly generated if, if they are non-elementary. And this provides yet another proof of the fact that the free group is not boundedly generated. Yeah. All right, so now I want to discuss uh, some motivation for uh, proving such a theorem. So for that, I will uh, mention a theorem uh, of Meiri. I will talk about that. I will talk about that, yeah. So in this theorem, what I also wanted to say is that uh, actually this group U is not something miraculous. We can compute it explicitly and say what is the index of U in L. Yeah. So a theorem by Meiri is very analogous to this theorem. Instead of G, he takes um, SLNZ with N greater than equal than 3. And instead of m, he takes 2, which is much, much better than my result. So what does he say? If you take a finite index subgroup L of S, L, and Z, then you can find a finite index subgroup U of L, which is generated by at most two elements for any n. So this theorem was motivated by a conjecture of uh, Lubotsky. So another result in this vein of uh, Sharma and Venkataramana is that you can take instead of M something slightly weaker, namely 3, some, uh, a weaker bound than 2, but you can prove the theorem where instead of G you take not only S, L, and Z, but any non-uniform arithmetic group of real rank greater or equal to 2. Yeah, so what I do in my theorem, I look at a variant of these results where G is an abstract thing. I don't think of it anymore as a, a linear as group, as a group of matrices, just any boundedly generated group. But when I weaken the bound on the number of generators you need for uh, this finite index subgroup, well, instead of taking something very explicit, I allow it uh, to be M. Well, so. No, no, uh, no. But I mean, the rank has to be at least two. I think that this is okay. We can check that after afterwards. Yeah, I think that this is, this formulation is the exact thing that they prove. But uh, we can check it. Yeah. So another uh, motivation for the result comes from the notion of the rank gradient of a group. So given a group G, I define its rank gradient to be the infimum over all finite index subgroups H of G of the number of generators of H minus 1 divided by the index in G of the finite index subgroup H. So the reason to define such a thing is maybe that for free groups, we know it uh, very well. For a free group, the number of generators grows linearly with the index. And we want to measure that for an arbitrary new group G. We want to know maybe it grows sublinearly or linearly with another constant. By the way, it cannot grow any faster than a linear function. So we want to know uh, what is the growth rate in some sense. So this is uh, some invariant of the group. And it was a conjecture made by Miklos Abert, Andrei Haikin Zapirain, and by Nikolai Nikolov, that if you look at the rank gradient of a residually finite boundedly generated infinite group, then you get zero. Well, there are many frightening words here, but I'll show in a minute that this is 
not so much to fear of because suppose we have such a boundedly generated group and we have a lot of finite index subgroups. For example, we have a finite index subgroup of an index as large as we want. Then by the theorem, we can pass to a finite index subgroup of it whose index is even bigger, but still the number of generators is at most m. So you see immediately that the numerator is bounded by m minus 1, while the denominator goes to infinity. So this limit approaches 0. So this proves this conjecture because residually finite means in particular that you have a lot of finite index subgroups to play with. So uh, this establishes that. So this is as for some motivation for the theorem. And uh, maybe now uh, some corollaries which is related to, to your question, is about to what can I say for an arbitrary uh, finite index subgroup. I mean, it's good that we have some bound for u, but what about the number of generators for L itself? It would be very nice to bound the number of generators of L itself and not of some uh, finite index subgroup. So here, I'm stating a corollary to my theorem is that, well, I work under the same assumptions <coughs> as in the theorem, and I will denote by n the index in G of this finite index subgroup L. So in this situation, I can show that the number of generators of L is at most, well, that doesn't matter what are the numbers exactly, but what matters is that uh, it grows sublinearly in the index. And if, well maybe what is more interesting that if the subgroup L is normal in G, then we can have a better bound, namely that the number of generators of L is at most M times the logarithm of N plus M, which is, which some, which is something which grows uh, really slowly and comes close to achieving the bound for any linear group, for example, for SL3Z or any such group, you can construct uh, normal subgroups of finite index whose number of generators is the logarithm of the index divided by the logarithm of the logarithm of the index. So this is not optimal, and maybe this is very far from optimal, but it somehow goes in the direction of uh, what we have for this, this specific boundedly generated groups. Well, okay, this is... This is a corollary, and now I think uh, it's time for the proof. So now I would like to prove my theorem. No, it's not clear. I should explain it, actually. Yeah. So uh, it's a little exercise. But suppose that we have L and we want to count its number of generators. What do we know from the theorem is that there exists a finite index subgroup U of L which does not have so much generators and we know from the theorem something about the index of U in L. So now we do just the most naive thing. We choose an element which is not in U but still in L and then increase our subgroup by adding this element. But when we increase the subgroup, the index reduces by at least 2. This is just Lagrange's theorem from finite group theory. And now you finish after making a logarithmic number of steps in the index of L in U. So I'm just using the bound that I have for U, and this is why more or less I have this logarithm here. So there is some computation, but more or less using this naive strategy, I get a bound for the number of generators for L. So it's part from the theorem with a, with a strict bound on the index of U in L? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is, there is a little bit, but yeah, more or less, basically. Yeah, so uh, for the proof of the theorem, I will make my life a bit easier by assuming that M just is equal to 2, because the idea is the same and it is a bit easier to write it down that way. So I will make some notations. So because L is a finite index subgroup of G, 
clearly there exists some integer k such that for any g in g, g to the k is an element in L. This is just because uh, L is a finite index subgroup of G. And I will make the following notation. I will use this one to denote the set of all residues mod k. So this can go from 0 to k in minus 1 or from 1 to k as you prefer. So now note that for every element in the group G, we have that the cyclic subgroup generated by G can be written as a disjoint union or just as a union over all i in this set of residues of g to the i times the subgroup generated by g to the k. Well, this is nothing, just doing mod k, right? This is, here we have all powers of g, here we have powers of g to the k, so I go by an arithmetic progression of, le of distance k, and then I use all the things mod k to make this union. So now I'll just use this for the group G. So if I begin with G, I can write it as a product of two cyclic subgroups because I made my life easier by assuming that M equals 2. So now I'll just apply this to each and every one of these two subgroups. So this is just the union over all I and J in this set K of g1 to the i, g1 to the k, and then g2 to the j, and then g2 to the k. Now, what I would like to do is to move g2 to the j to the other side. It will be nicer to have here the, hel the elements and here the subgroups. So to move it, I will first make some space. So I move g1 to the i here. And now how will I move it? I'm just writing it down, g2 to the j, and here g2 to the minus j to compensate so that you won't say that there is a mistake here. So now it's okay, right? What I have now is that I have just a conjugation by g2 to the j of some cyclic subgroup. And this is the same thing as taking the cyclic subgroup which is generated by the element conjugated by g2 to the j. So I'll just write it down. So, um, because I don't care too much about the exact element, I will make some piece of notation. I will say that lambda j is equal to that conjugated element. So this will be g2 to the minus j, and here g1 to the k, and now g2 to the j. So just rewriting it, I will get that this is the union over all i and j mod k. And here I have g1 to the i and g2 to the j. And now the subgroup generated by lambda j to the k, and then the subgroup generated by g2 to the k. Do you have an extra k? In the lambda j, you need to delete from k. What do I have? Uh, an extra k. No, it, I think that this is okay, actually. Ah, yeah. I wanted to say that lambda j will be like that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, lambda j is just the element, and I want to keep the fact on the board that it is something to the power of k. Yeah, thank you. So now, just a simple thing. This is contained in the subgroup generated by these two elements. So the product of two subgroups is clearly contained in the subgroup that these two elements generate. So this is contained in the union over all i and j of g1 to the i, and then g2 to the j, and this is lambda j to the k, together with g2 to the k. All right, this is what I wanted. So now, just note that the group G is covered by finitely many cosets of some finite, sets of finite set of subgroups. So now, an amazing lemma of Bernard Hermann Newman tells us that one of these subgroups has to have finite index in the group G. Well, this is kind of not surprising if you think about this using measure. You're, you have something, you have a space which has positive measure, and you cover it by some subspaces, subgroups, or cosets, 
And if finitely many of them, and each one of them would have zero measure, this would be a kind of contradiction. So one of them has to have positive measure, which means finite index, and the index actually has to be, at most, the number of things I'm taking here in the union. So this works the way we expect. So this is what allows me to get a quantitative uh, version of the theorem. So just uh, to see how it goes, so I know that there exists a j, an i and j, such that the subgroup uj has a finite index in the group g. But clearly, uj is contained in L, just because of the way I define k. k is defined such that everything to the k is in L. So these two guys are in L, so the subgroup itself is in L, and it's generated by two elements. So this is what we had to prove, right? We had to find a finite index subgroup of L, which is generated by at most m elements. And this is what we did for the case uh, m equals 2 here. All right. Uh, well, so now uh, let me discuss uh, some relations or uh, applications of this approach to ergodic theory. And I will have to erase something for that. Uh, so, to go from n equals yeah, just the same. Is it, is it the same thing? Yeah, the trick I had to do here to move g1 to the i a bit to the side to make these guys fit there, you will have to do it m times, which I did not want to make here on the board. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, it's very useful, but the proof is like half a page of an induction. I mean, uh, the proof is not difficult. Uh, so, let me recast this result in a slightly different language. So, suppose I want uh, to calculate the rank gradient of uh, some group G. So, since this definition involves an infimum, I will take some, say, sequence of finite index subgroups and see what, where does this limit go? I want to, ca to calculate this infinite. So I will take, uh, well, ui or un uh, be a sequence of a finite index subgroups of my group G. So I can use the sequence to construct kind of a graph or a geometric object in, in the following way. So I will suppose for simplicity, and you will see exactly how will I use this assumption, that the intersection of this chain is uh, trivial. Now what can I do is uh, the following. I will just uh, maybe draw a picture of that. So I have the group G, and I have these subgroups. So this is U1, and U2, <coughs> and so on. So I'll think about these just as layers, and at every layer I will have the coset space of the group G mod U1, and mod U2, and so on. So here we ha we'll have all the cosets of G mod U1, and here we'll have all the cosets of G mod U2. And this naturally gives rise to a graph, right? If I connect a coset of a subgroup with a coset of another subgroup, if one coset contains the other, right? So every coset of one subgroup is a union of cosets of subgroups. And in this way, I get a very nice graph. Well, it will be an infinite graph, but it in, in fact will be a tree. This is simply because the cosets of, uh, of, of a subgroup are disjoint if the cosets are uh, different. So this gives rise, this construction gives rise to a tree <coughs> on which the group G acts. 
So why does it act on this tree? G clearly acts on the coset space mod every finite index subgroup. So if I just look at this action on the whole tree, there will be one big action of uh, the group G. So, and this gives rise to a very nice probability space. So the probability space of all infinite paths, um, say, starting from the root. From uh, the root, which is just the unique coset of G in G. So what, is the, what are these infinite paths? I have this tree, and I'm looking at all the possible paths. So I'm starting in G, and I choose to what coset do I want to go. I go to this coset, and then I have, again, a lot of cosets to which I can go. So I choose another coset. And this, this way I can randomly pick an infinite path starting from G. Is it a profinite space? Or? So Lior, as always, knows the answer. This is the profinite completion of the group G. So this probability space of infinite paths is isomorphic as a topological space or as a measure space with this probability to the, well, this is not an exactly correct, but more or less isomorphic to the profinite completion of G. So in order to make it completely correct, I need to make a profinite completion with respect to certain chain. But I will just keep this notation. This is not entirely correct, but this is isomorphic to some profinite space, which you can uh, generate from G. If the sequence of UN is, for example, if each UN is the intersection of all finite index subgroups of index at most n, a kind of an exhausting sequence of finite index subgroups. In this case, this is indeed isomorphic to the profinite completion of G. <coughs> but in general, no, but let us uh, pretend, pretend so. <coughs> so uh, that way or another, well, let me okay, I'll get this down. What we get here is an action of G on some uh, probability space. So the point here that I want to emphasize is that we get a probability measure preserving action of G which is free by free, I mean that the stabilizer of a point, of any point on the space in we, on which we act, is the trivial subgroup of G. And this follows from my assumption that the intersection of the chain is trivial. So if indeed, so we have this action and it is free, and it also has another property, namely ergodicity. This action is ergodic. So what that means is that if we take some measurable subset <coughs> of our space and we know that this measurable subset is invariant under the action of G, this means that it has either measure 0 or measure 1. So there are no intermediate invariant uh, subsets under the action of G. So maybe naturally uh, I would like to say that ergodic theory is interested in these kinds of actions and what it associates to such an action is, among others, the notion of the cost of this action. So every such action on some space X has a cost. So we will write this as the cost of the action of G on X, on some space X. So I'm not telling you what this cost is or how is it defined. It has some definition. Maybe it is possible to say that it reminds you of entropy of an action. But what I can tell you is that in that case, the cost of the action for this specific action on the probability space of all infinite paths starting from the root, the cost is equal to the rank gradient of the group G plus 1. So this makes a connection between something which is defined in ergodic theory, namely the cost 
of a probability measure preserving free ergodic action of a group on a probability space, and something which is entirely combinatoric or group theoretic, which is the rank gradient I have defined here. So in light of that, it may be natural to ask whether the result uh, carries over. Namely, the theory implies that the rank gradient of a boundedly generated group is uh, zero. So maybe it can be even proved for, for the cost. In this case, the cost is equal to one because this is zero. And we have used many specific properties of this action using finite index subgroups, but maybe this is not necessary. For example, note that uh, this theorem tells you nothing if there are no finite index subgroups in the group G to start with. I mean, if you cannot pick any L, the theorem is vacuous. But maybe it can tell you something about the cost, because maybe there are no finite index subgroups, but it is possible that there are some nice actions of the group G coming from ergodicity. So, and the answer is yes. And this is a theorem, a joint work uh, with Robin Tucker Drub. that tells you that the cost of any probability measure preserving action which is free energetic of a boundedly generated group <laughs> is equal to one. So it may be kind of surprising because in the argument we have seen here, I use in a very essential way properties of groups and of finite index subgroups and things like that. So how would that uh, generalize to prove something about a situation where you have no finite index subgroups? So it turns out that even if you have no finite index subgroups, if you look just at this action, it will have finite index sub actions, which I will not define now, but I will say that the strategy of the proof goes more or less the same way to show uh, this and a result about the cost. So maybe this is not so inspiring because it doesn't tell us anything, nothing new about group theory where we started from. So uh, let me mention now another application of this approach uh, for groups. So it turns out that if uh, G is uh, boundedly generated, <coughs> by a billion subgroups. Well, what does that mean, boundedly generated by a billion subgroups? The notion of bounded generation that we had so far, you can think about it as bounded generation by cyclic subgroups. So my group here is a product of cyclic subgroups, and I can allow it to be a product of a billion subgroups. Of course, if these a billion subgroups are themselves finitely generated, then this is nothing new because a finitely generated abelian group is a product of finitely many uh, cyclic subgroups, as we know. So, but it can be the product of a billion subgroups which are not themselves finitely generated. So even in this situation, uh, so if G is, a boundedly, is boundedly generated by a billion subgroups, then we can still show that the rank gradient of the group G is equal to zero. More or less the same conclusion as in the boundedly generated case. And to prove this, I think that we kind of really need to go through the definition of uh, cost. So the way that uh, Robin and me proved it is that we showed that the cost of any action of this kind has to be one. Because if you think about it, you will see that this argument uses in a, in a very strong way the fact that these subgroups are finitely generated because it does some combinatorics on the set of generators. If the subgroups are not finitely generated, you cannot do that. But luckily enough, you can do some analysis to show uh, the same result. So you may ask, like, why, what is it good for? Like, 
are there even gen interesting subgroups which are boundedly generated by abelian subgroups? Where do we take examples of this form? So, in fact, there exists such subgroups, and it is maybe in a way the function field analog of the number theoretic groups that we saw. We had SL3Z and SLN over OK, which were uh, boundedly generated. So some uh, linear groups, some matrix groups in positive characteristic tend to be uh, boundedly generated by abelian subgroups. So this actually gives us a new class of groups for which we can prove that the rank gradient uh, is equal to zero. So for a group like SL3, F3, yeah. this, is, this would not know? Or for the specific... That is a very <coughs> good example for your... For a specific group, it could have been known. But for a general linear group over a finite field, I think that no, it was not known. No, I mean, I mean, not everyone. I mean, everyone which is suspected to be boundedly generated by abelian sum. Yeah, it's not that strong. I mean, many of the, of the results I mentioned here were not so clear even for uh, linear groups. I mean, the bounds on the numbers of generators. So, well, I think I will... Uh, yeah. You stated the cost theorem for... First, you stated the cost theorem for boundedly generated groups, but not for boundedly generated by abelian groups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have shown that the cost of any probability measure preserving action of uh, boundedly generated by abelian <laughs> groups has cost one, which means that it has fixed price one. This is the language they use for that. Yeah, so I think I'll just uh, stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>